So this decade, I believe, is going to be a decade of roller coasters. And, uh, and I call it the decade of the roller coasters. And I think these roller coasters are just about uh, the you know, opposite of what we have seen for passive investors in the last 10, 15 years. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. At the close of one of the worst years for stocks and bonds combined on record, markets are trying to engineer a year-end rally to convince investors the bear market is over. Is it? As we enter 2023, where is all of this headed? Will asset prices shrug off the growing litany of macro concerns and recover in the new year? Or will 2023 be another bruising year for portfolios? Well, I can't think of anyone better to ask these questions to than today's experts, Felix Zuloff, owner and president of Zuloff Asset Management, who last appeared on this program in early February and made the prediction of a 20% market correction by mid-year, which proved to be dead on accurate. Felix manages billions in assets, so he doesn't have the luxury of holding an opinion without a conviction. He's got a strong picture of where we are in the current market cycle and is allocating capital accordingly. Felix, thanks very much for joining us today all the way from Switzerland. I know you don't do many interviews and we're extremely grateful you've chosen to return to this program. Thank you very much uh, for having me, Adam. Uh, it's a great it's a great donor. Thank you. Well, well, same here. And I've got to tell you, Felix, you are the number one most requested guest by the wealthy on audience. Um, folks love your work in general, but we're uh, just very impressed by your spot on prediction of the market action for 2022. So uh, a lot of people are have been eagerly awaiting your return here. Uh, I've got a number of questions for you, but if we can, let's just start on the normal jumping off question I like to ask. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, we have uh, gone in 2022, we have gone through a tightening process uh, by central banks around the world, uh, particularly the US central bank, the most important one of them. Uh, and uh, we are also seeing that uh, the world economy is slowing. I do believe that uh, the economy that is in the deepest recession or in the worst shape right now is China. Uh, China is in a deeper recession than in probably 2008. Uh, it will come out of it, but it will be a structural problem for China for many, many years after the huge um, infrastructure boom and credit boom that they have enjoyed. A second uh, deepest recession I expect in 23 for Europe. Europe is suffering from structural changes and particularly the sharp rise in energy prices. That is not just cyclical, I think that is structural uh, due to the geopolitical changes, uh, due to the Ukrainian war and the dividing uh, world into two major blocks again. We could talk about geopolitics later, uh, but this is um, uh, pushing Europe in a very disadvantaged uh, position. And I think uh, Europe will lose uh, uh, some companies, some production sites, uh, some multinational companies moving their production sites over to other regions. And I think this is the beginning of a structural weakening of the European economy. Uh, the US is in a better shape. Uh, the, and, and when I say Europe, I also mean the UK. The UK is also in a pretty bad shape at the present time and will weaken further in the first half of next year. So all these regions that I have mentioned will be extremely weak in the first half of 2023. Now, the US is somewhat different because the US is still benefiting from the huge fiscal stimulus, the money that was uh, spread out uh, throughout the economy to consumers. And, and the consumers are drawing down that money that they had saved in 2020. And, and therefore, uh, what is hitting the economy is uh, the rising interest rates. It hits uh, interest rate sensitive segments like housing, real estate, and the automobile sector. But the service sector is still doing well. 
I do believe that the US economy will also weaken, it will slow down and probably have a mild recession in the middle of, uh, in the middle two quarters of 2023, uh, but nothing very serious. But in total, it makes for a very weak world economy in the first half of 2023. And US investors should not take too much comfort from that uh, because 50% of the S&P's earnings come from overseas. And therefore, I think uh, 2023 will see a much bigger decline in corporate profits for the S&P 500 than for GDP or than GDP decline or weakening would suggest. Uh, so that's the economic setup. Uh, what we do not know is whether there will be a credit event or not. Usually when highly levered economies weaken, usually there are some credit events. Uh, some corporations that have uh, an extended uh, balance sheet and are wrongly positioned uh, get hit, etc. I think the risk for such events is biggest in China, uh, where the deflationary pressure from the real estate sector is very high. And we should not forget that uh, China is highly interlinked with the world economy and also with the financial world economy. Uh, and, and there are still huge amounts of loans outstanding to corporate entities in China. And therefore, we do not know whether such a credit event will happen. I assume we have to uh, expect one and what it will mean. Uh, so I think uh, the equity markets that I have been bearish on for about a year now will hit the low sometimes in early uh, 23, probably late first quarter, I would say, where larger trading cycles bottom. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we have a credit event or something like that, a trigger that signals to the central banks around the world that they should ease up, that too much damage is being uh, created out there in the world. And then I expect the change in, in uh, monetary policy by the leading central banks. And that should um, uh, really open the door for a better 23 for financial assets. Uh, I, I think uh, bond yields uh, have probably an open window for six, maximum nine months to decline. Um, and uh, equities um, uh, will probably rally into 24 uh, and commodities probably even into 25. Uh, so, so I'm warming up uh, to a major market bottom or a cyclical market bottom and a better environment for 23 for investors. So my message is actually um, uh, some pain, short-term pain first, but um, bigger gains later and a good outlook in 23 into 24. Um, I, I think the first leg up in that uh, big cyclical rally will probably led by the growth stocks, that would be in sync with declining bond yields. And the growth stocks have uh, gone through a very severe correction. Just ask some of the ARK investors, you know, uh, uh, 75 or 78% down or something like that from the peak. So I think growth stocks will have a big bounce in the first up leg. But after that, I think the leadership will go back to uh, the back end of the cycle, the value and cyclical stocks, and particularly energy and the metals, uh, precious metals and things like that. Um, th that's basically uh, the big picture outcome in terms of the e economic landscape and the equity markets and, and interest rates. All right. That was a phenomenal answer. Uh, I feel almost like I need to just throw my sheet away because you ticked almost <laughs> all the questions I was going to okay. ask, which is the sign of a wonderful guest. Um, all right. So um, it seems like uh, you see the current weakness. I, I think initially when we talked, Felix, which which admittedly was before 
the Ukraine war, it was before uh, several hundred basis points of hiking by the central, uh, the, the Federal Reserve and, and, and the quantitative tightening that's that's recently started. Um, you were you were expecting this sort of um, central bank intervention a, a bit sooner, um, perhaps maybe even at the end of this year. It seems like that's all been sort of shoved now into 2023. So looks like we bought them by your your predictions here, maybe by the end of Q1 of 2023. And, and then we have the the recovery in the asset prices you're talking about. And it does seem, and this is what I want to really clarify with you, it does seem that that is all predicated on kind of quote unquote something breaking, right? There being some big credit uh, calamity somewhere that forces the central banks to pivot policy pretty aggressively. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Usually we see something breaking at the end of a cyclical down uh, market, the bear market, uh, and uh, usually it's somewhere in the region or associated with an industry that um, experienced the uh, huge excesses before. And, and I think uh, China is where the biggest credit excesses have been and where there is some uh, real estate deflation going on. Mm -hmm. which, create, which creates um, uh, deflationary problems and could lead to some uh, shocking events. I'm, you know, I, I cannot predict what and where the credit event will be, but I, I think it's normal to expect something along those lines late in the down cycle, because the tightening of money means that there is too expensive money or not enough money available for some of the weak guys out there. Yep. And, and then they get hit. And when that hits, that is the signal for the Fed, the message for the Fed and other central banks, now we have gone too far. Now we have to correct because if this goes further, then more of those entities could fall into problems. And then we have a much bigger problem on our desk. Okay, so um, this is slightly an American-centric um, question, but Jerome Powell is talking a tough game right now, right? And he's he's basically saying, look, I am prioritizing keeping inflation under control, right? Um, and his plan is to hike even more uh, and then keep rates high for a prolonged period of time uh, to let the current uh you know, policy hikes he's already made and tightening he's done kind of fully ripple their way through the system. Sounds like you're saying he's probably not going to get that luxury. There's going to be this breakage event beforehand. Um, uh, and what's interesting is, is you said the U.S. is in better shape than a lot of these other regions. And I think maybe there's a confidence here on behalf of our central planners that, OK, we have our plan and we're going to we're going to execute on it. I hear you saying, no, there's the potential for contagion even outside the US to come ripple in here. Sounds like China's at the top of your list for that. Can you just explain real quickly in, in the Chinese scenario, um, uh, how a cascade of bad loans in China, like how would you expect that to, to, to blow back onto the US? Would that be uh, funds here that are exposed to those loans or is it China would, would end up having to default on other certain commitments to the U.S.? What, 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 how might, what, what's a likely path that could take? Okay, uh, let's look at China just in an isolated way. If the Chinese authorities would do what most of the exports are expecting and tell them to do, namely stimulate like mad to mm -hmm. get out of the hole, uh, they would trigger off a slump in the Chinese currency. And the slump of the Chinese currency would trigger off an Asian crisis uh, probably bigger than in 1997. The, this would be detrimental to the long-term goals of China in terms of trade and politics. And therefore, they are not going to do that. Therefore, they are trying to sit it out, help the here and there, etc. Now, if we have a credit event in China, we have to keep in mind that there are a few trillions of bank loans, US dollar denominated, to Chinese entities. And, uh, and uh, I mean, in, in, the early, in early 21, uh, China, the government, 
ask those corporations, those debtors, to pay back at least one quarter of the outstanding dollar-denominated loans because they do not want to be in the position of getting blackmailed by the US when they are entering a conflict situation with them. So they have paid back some of them, but I assume that there are still at least three trillion um, dollars out there in bank loans. And those are short-term loans, not long-term loans. And, and if um, a, an entity cannot pay back, it hits back to the US banking system. And maybe in between the US banks, there are European banks or Japanese banks or Singapore banks. So it rattles the whole uh, international banking um, industry. And, and, and in that sense, we are all connected. Right. Okay. Um, so folks watching, when you hear about the, the, the phrase contagion risk, that's exactly what Felix is describing here. Um, so if the Fed and the other major world central banks that are tightening right now are forced to pivot by Q1, um, I mean, it's highly unlikely by that point, um, Felix, that that the inflation problem in most major economies is going to be brought under control. So what do you see happening to inflation if there's a forced pivot like that? Well, in inflation has peaked uh, for this mini cycle. Uh, uh, I, I think what you have is you have declining commodity prices. Uh, you have uh, probably a whiff of deflation that is coming to the Western world from China. So our import prices will go down. They have been rising for a while. They will go down with the uh, Chinese situation as it is. And, and therefore, I think these two entities together with the base effect make three factors will bring inflation down. Whether it will go down to 2%, I doubt, but that's not the point. If inflation uh, declines, let's say, to 4% uh, by uh, spring, uh, and that is, uh, that is uh, conceivable, uh, and, and we have uh, a, a weak world economy and a um, credit event, a calamity out there, I think that is good enough for the Fed to pivot. All right. Um, what do you think, though, after it pivots as we look forward for the next year, let's say, because it sounds like when the Fed pivots, you're expecting pretty substantial uh, policy response. Um, does inflation just jump right back up again or will it will it be a much slower process than that? When central banks turn around and ease, it uh, means that they create excess liquidity in the system. And that excess liquidity in the system cannot be taken up by the real economy. Therefore, it flows to the financial economy uh, or into, into scarce assets. And I think scarce assets are commodities, particularly in a divided world that I see geopolitically. Uh, where um, the Western world is short a lot of the commodities that are produced by, uh, by uh, Russia, uh, for, for instance, so, and, and, other and other countries that are not uh, that friendly anymore with the Western world, uh, then those items are scarce. And therefore, the money flows where the scarcity is. And that means that we could see the next uh, commodity bull market beginning by mid-year or so, uh, starting um, uh, with rising commodity prices into 24 or maybe even 25, not necessarily because of robust demand. Uh, demand will bounce back with the improve with the economic improvement later in 23, but due to uh, scarce supply. Scarcity. And scarcity and and therefore and therefore i think you know if oil goes up uh, to 150 or 200 dollars in uh, in 24 uh, our cpi inflation in the western world will be double digits right and and therefore i believe that inflation will come back and the next inflation cycle starting in, let's say, the second half of 23 and lasting into 25 or 26 will go higher 
then it has peaked in this current mini cycle. Oof. And that means and that means that bond yields will also go higher. This will be the second uh, cycle of rising inflation rates. And in the first cycle, what we have learned in the 1970s, and I lived through that as a young speculator, um, in the 1970s, the first rise in inflation was not that bad for bonds. I mean, bond yields went up, but they didn't uh, go to uh, very high levels. <clears throat> the second rise in inflation, the bond market has learned that the interest inflation rates go higher and therefore the bond market wanted to be paid for that risk. Mm -hmm. And therefore bond yields go much higher. So I could see treasuries trading at the 8% yield or even higher in the midst um, of this decade. And, and, and that would at some point, and my guess is 24, uh, trigger the next uh, economic downturn and the next bear market. So this decade, I believe, is going to be a decade of roller coasters. And, uh, and I call it the decade of the roller coasters. And I think these roller coasters are just about uh, the you know, opposite of what we have seen for passive investors in the last 10, 15 years. Passive investment in a steadily rising bull market is wonderful. That's the right way to do it. But in a roller coaster, passive investors with a 60-40 portfolio or whatever the mix is, um, will end up with very poor returns and most likely with very poor real returns. So they will lose out. That means that investors have to uh, train themselves to uh, play the cycle. I do not mean short-term trading. I mean really selling when a bear cycle begins and buying when a bull cycle begins. And you can never hit the uh, exact extreme, but uh, somewhere nearby, you can probably do it uh, as an experienced professional. And that's what we try to do for our subscribers. And, and so if they ride the bull cycles and just step to the side in the bear cycle, they will come out very well. If they are experienced and professional and they can even short during the bear cycle, they will do exceptionally well. So I think that's the new environment we are in. And it's all compounded by the new world we are in. You know, recently I looked at the map of uh, the trading partners, the major trading partners of the US and China in this divided world. And in the year 2000, all the trading partners that traded more with the US were in blue color. And all those traded more with China were in red color. In the year 2000, it was red was China, North Korea, and a few other smaller uh, countries. And the rest of the world was blue. When you look at today's map, you know, there is North America, NAFTA, uh, Middle America, blue, uh, the very western part of Europe, blue, and virtually the whole rest of the world is red. And, and we in the West have not understood yet that we live in a very different world. We think we are still as powerful and as influential as we were, and we try to dictate policies that the rest of the world thinks these are fools. We do not do that. That's not to our liking. And it backfires. And you see that particularly well in the case of Europe, the sanctions and boycotts against Russia is backfiring against Europe. And I, I feel that Europe, unfortunately, will step down to a lower league because of that. So it's a, it's a completely different world. And it's a world that is uh, creating an economy that is like a war economy with scarcities. Uh, I recently had to buy a, a new washing machine in, uh, in our place in the US. And the, the, tra the, the dealer told us uh, it's um, uh, 12 months waiting time for international brands and it's six months waiting time for, for domestic brands. And that's the new world, you know, and this will not change. And even if 
China will restart, which occasionally they will. It is a divided world and the supply chains will never be as it was. And the world will never be as globalized as it was. It will be deglobalizing and it will become less efficient and it will become more inflationary and, and, and more pricey. And therefore the average chore will, uh, will lose out he will be less prosperous and at the end of this decade. And therefore it's important to uh, make the best out of your money in this roller coaster decade. Uh, Felix, that was a phenomenal opining there. And, and I have so many questions for you now. Um, maybe just on that last one first, um, I was thinking about asking you this about 10 minutes ago and you've really just put your finger on it. Um, uh, it's this, I love this quote of, of the decay of roller coasters, right? And it seems like every time it, it gets worse, um, it gets worse for the masses much more than it's going to get worse for the wealthy. Um, and every time there's a rescue, it's a rescue that's going to push up the financial assets, which of course the wealthy disproportionately own. And it tends to come along with increased costs of living, which hurts the, the masses even more, right? How concerned are you about, I mean, the wealth gap was was a, a big concern, you know, years ago, but it's really gotten exacerbated by the policy response since uh, the pandemic. And I suspect, given the additional policy responses that you expect going forward, um, particularly once something breaks here in 2023, um, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse for the mass public. Do you, do you fear at all that there's going to be a breaking point at some point socially? Uh, that is the normal way of uh, development, basically. And when you study history, uh, uh, these are we are entering a period where there will be revolts. And uh, if it goes peacefully, the revolt will be in uh, elections. Uh, that they change governments when the uh, select selections are not good enough, then there could be a new party. Maybe the U.S. needs uh, three parties or four parties or whatsoever. I don't know, uh, but there will be changes. I do believe that at the end of this decade, our political system will be very different and the people will vote against the current leadership and the nonsense policies they are pursuing. Uh, and, and that is uh, in, in the whole democratic world, in the whole democratic world. In some countries, it may get worse. It may be a real revolution. You know, we have seen, uh, I mean, we are used to revolutions in, uh, in poorer countries. Uh, we, we have seen uh, currency reforms in poorer countries, and it could very well be that later this decade, it could come to the industrialized democracies. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, um, do you see that as ultimately being a change for the good that, hey, we finally demand more sane policies? Or is there a concern, especially in the democracies and capitalist nations, the public just losing faith and beginning to sort of hear the siren song of more sort of socialistic policies of, hey, if I'm going to get kind of screwed by the system, I may as well vote for the guy who's promising me, you know, free stuff along the way. Mm. Um, th that is the big risk. And I cannot tell you, we will see as we go along uh, during this decade. But the risk is that we uh, could end up in a less free world and with administered economies, I would say. Administered economies means that the government decides much more than what it does today and that, that sounds very Soviet. Have, and that and yeah the, i mean in the soviet union we had 100 percent government uh, uh, economy you know there were no there was no private sector so to speak uh, i think the private sector is constantly shrinking relative to the government sector we see that going on everywhere even in the US, you know, in the US, we have jumped from uh, the low 20% uh, several years ago, we are now up to the upper 30% of uh, government share of GDP. In, uh, in the European Union, we are at uh, 59%, so more than half. In France, we are at 64%. Uh, 
Um, in China, we are at 35%, and I have been traveling to China when it was at 100%. Mm. They have gone the, in the other direction. So, so I think there are big changes coming, but I cannot uh, tell you at the present time what direction it will go. My fear is that it will be more administered economies than free market economies uh, in the future. Okay. Um, and, and as you talk about this divided world, and you, you gave that, that great uh, example of looking at the map in terms of who traded with China and who traded more with the, with the West or the US, um, I've got to imagine that um, the intensity of the red of, of the, the map over time must have really gotten um, catalyzed, uh, and that's probably an understatement, after the the Russian war in the Ukraine, right? Where, you know, we sort of weaponized our financial system against Russia, and we basically yeah. forced the world more or less to kind of begin to determine who they want to trade more with. That was the biggest blunder, uh, and the Biden administration has made many blunders, but that was the biggest blunder by far, uh, weaponizing uh, the US dollar and the SWIFT payment system, because that taught the world that is not as close uh, and friendly to the US as, as some others, that we should not uh, hold our reserves in the US dollar. Therefore, the US dollar's role as the major reserve currency is beginning to decline. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know China cannot store its reserves in US treasuries any longer. And I think they know that as well as I do. And therefore, I believe that uh, in the current cycle, you will see that there will be a shift once the US dollar has stopped. And I think there is going to be another rally in the first quarter in the US dollar back to the highs, if not to higher highs uh, before it rolls over, uh, that those countries will put their reserves into stuff, into hard assets that they can store within their own national boundaries and nobody can freeze the, those assets and things like that. I think this was so dumb, so stupid by the US government, uh, it's unbelievable. They basically terminated the dollar system that was a non-system. They had not, it had no rules, but they terminated that, so to speak. And you know, and you can see the outcome. Look, a few years ago, Saudi Arabia was a very close ally of the US. And there was a contract uh, in the from the 1940s that the Saudis uh, get all the protection, uh, the government gets all the protection by the US military. And the, U and the Saudis in return sell their oil only against US dollars. That will That's end. what people refer to when they talk about the petrodollar, yeah. correct? Yeah, and, and that will end. Uh, the Saudis will sell uh, oil against renminbi to the Chinese. They are even building missiles, what I hear, um, um, with help uh, from uh, the China and the Chinese with Chinese technologies. They have moved farther away from the US. And I think the US um, foreign policies uh, over recent years has not been very successful. And we will only feel it in, a, in future years, going further into the future, when we see that the influence of the US on the world will be less and less. Okay, and it sounds like you think largely that is a self-inflicted wound that the US made bad decisions that it didn't necessarily need to make that is now condemning it to this worse future. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. You... All right. Well, you uh, you you asked. I was going to take it to the short term outlook for the dollar, but I, I think I just heard you give it, which is it seems like um, as the markets continue to weaken in the Q1, as you expect, you expect the the dollar strength, which has been pretty ferocious this year. It's it's come off a little bit recently, but you you expect more likely that to to resurge back through. Q1 as things deteriorate, but then when the policy pivot hits, presumably you expect that to go down. That's exactly right. The, the, the dollar hit uh, its high 
in September. Uh, it has corrected since September. Uh, it's down six, seven percent or something like that uh, from the high. I think it's close to a short term bottom and it will be bottoming out here in December and then have another rally in the first few months uh, of the new year. And I think that goes together probably with bond yields. Uh, bond yields have also peaked in late September, early October uh, and, uh, and have declined pretty sharply. And I think they have also another shot up whether that will go just back to the highs or near the highs or to higher highs, I do not know. But once that shot up in the dollar and bond yields is over, that's when you can enter the bond market for a great six month rally. And uh, that's also the uh, opening bang uh, for a recovery rally that could be quite powerful in growth stocks. And then you switch to energy stocks again. Okay, and, and when you talk about powerful, I might be risk misremembering, but I, I think I remember from our previous conversation when you were projecting the the pivot that you were you were saying that like some stocks, some parts of the market might even like double through mm -hmm. 2024, 25, like that ferocious uh, a, a, a recovery. I, I, am I remembering correctly? Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, what I said. I wanted to make it clear that this is a down market first and then a strong up market. And you couldn't make it clear by that statement. <laughs> you, you yeah. know? Uh, so so I, I, I believe that the surprise could be that we go much higher on that rally than uh, everybody thinks. And that is, um, you know, uh, somebody with a label of a bear. Uh, I, I'm labeled a bear in the, in the in international uh, community, uh, says so. Uh, I, I do not know for sure, because I do not know the future for sure, but I think the opportunity is there that the surprises could be on the upside in, in some of those stocks and some of those indices. Yes. Oh, okay, great. So it sounds like you're saying when the pivot occurs, that's likely sort of a back up the truck moment for investors on the bullish side. I, I hope that when that happens, Felix, after you've communicated to your subscribers, uh, we'll have a chance to bring you back on here and you can you can update your outlook and, and determine whether or not that is indeed what you think at that time. Well, we'll see. I do not uh, expose myself too often to the public. You, you know. don't, I know. Which, and again, <laughs> we very much appreciate you choosing to come on here. Um, all right. Well, I did promise your team, uh, Felix, uh, given how busy you are, that that uh, we uh, we wrap things up here. Um, in, in doing so, if if if, it, if you feel comfortable sharing, how how are you beginning to position right now for the, the next leg here of the cycle? It seems like, from what you're saying, the next leg here is is likely a down leg, at least through you know Q end of Q1 until and at least. Uh, there's the the pivot announcement. So I assume that probably you're 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 more defensively positioned. You probably have some shorts on, would be my guess. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm neutral right now, and I uh, am looking to tip um, a net short uh, very soon. Yes. All right. And are there any assets that you you think would would do well in in the next? couple of months as, as things go down or do you think it's just everything is is headed down so you know no, no I think even gold will uh, will have a relapse uh, even gold will have a relapse uh, uh, but I think uh, gold and the gold mining stocks uh, will offer a great opportunity sometimes during the first quarter all right so just to put some words in your mouth feel free to change for for the average investors that are watching here probably wise to consider now is a chance, especially as the market has rallied a bit, a time to to build dry capital yeah. um, and then be positioned more liquid when there are better values uh, ahead. And maybe for the more aggressive and experienced investors, maybe time to start putting some shorts on. That's correct. You know, for the uh, average investor, the performance really is decided how you behave at the major juncture points uh, to the bear market and to a bull market. And I think they should be uh, highly liquid right now, and they should wait for the opportunity in the first few months of the new year to go long and then ride the bull cycle into 24. 
Okay. And uh, last point on this is from what you said earlier um, about how it's been a great two decades or so for passive investing. Sounds like you don't think it's going to be great for passive in, uh, investing going forward. You're going to have to more actively manage these cycles that you're talking about. Um, one of the things that we that I do on Wealthy on a lot is encourage the average investor who doesn't have a lot of experience actively investing their portfolio these days, especially in a regime where inflation is getting janked around. You know, they've been having to deal with inflation for so long that they work under the guidance of a professional financial investor who has. One takes into consideration all the macro issues you and I talk about, but also has some history in dealing in these markets. I mean, there's so many, so many investors these days, sorry, financial advisors these days that have never been in an inflationary market and have never done anything except just ride the trend, right? Because it's paid off so far. Your, your point is a very good one. I do believe that uh, the average investor needs uh, a professional advice but not from uh, those who have just been uh, riding the last uh, 10, 15 years up, but those who have gone through uh, difficult times like in the 70s and uh, inflationary periods and roller coaster markets. And there are not that many dinosaurs around, uh, but you have, <laughs> to, you have to find them. You have to find them because they, be very they will be very valuable. Uh, as you know, in, in 2002 or 2008 at the bottom, all you needed was a 25 year old who had no experience and you tell him be bullish and he just rode the market much better than anybody else. I think now you need um, a gray hair type of person who helps you to guide you through these roller coaster times. All right. Well, well said. Um, well, Felix, as we wrap up here, for folks that have very much enjoyed this conversation with you, where can they go to learn more about you and your work? You can go to felixzulauf, one word, dot com and, uh, and request some information. All right. And I'm just curious, um, Zulauf Consulting, um, is, is what type of clients are, are best for that company? Uh, we have uh, all sorts of clients. It's basically uh, institutional. Uh, it goes from uh, long only money managers, uh, um, uh, international fund uh, companies, uh, hedge funds, uh, uh, family offices, and very wealthy individuals. So it's the whole variety uh, that subscribes to our research because they like to get the um, an outside uh, maverick view uh, of the situation, not the mainstream view, a maverick view. All right. Well, Felix, thank you so much for sharing your maverick view here. It is such a pleasure and honor to have you on this program. Uh, I look forward to the next time you decide to uh, update the public uh, on your, your updated views uh, in 2023. Hopefully we get you back on here. But I just want to say it's it's just been a true pleasure, Felix. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Adam, for having me. Thank you. Real quick before you leave, to get my notes on the key takeaways from this interview with Felix for free, just go to Wealthion.com slash Adam's Notes. And if you'd like to see Felix again on this channel and other great investing experts like him, please support this channel by first hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And finally, if the challenging macro outlook Felix detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Felix has mentioned here. Just go to wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Felix Zuloff as much as I did, and thanks for watching.